Welcome to the Flyman Fishing Show, where we talk fly fishing, fly tying, and everything in between. I'm your host, Scotty Davis. Hey. What's happening? Is it working? I can hear you. Cool. How are you? Still standing upright. How are you? Barely. <laughs> I had to adjust my screen to make it look like I'm vertical. <laughs> How you been? I'm doing all right, man. I'm uh, in recovery from uh, getting back from two and a half weeks in Florida. So it's oh, like sweet. adjustment back to normal life a little bit. What were you doing down there? Um, I've got a couple of friends that are sailing around the world. What? And that was like their second stop. So they said, hey, you have a boat and you like to fish. You should come teach us and hang out with us. And bring us some fresh fruit. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so I went down there and we, uh, we, we fished a little bit. It was a lot of more of exploring, drinking, snorkeling, fishing, drinking, exploring, you know. just Where, where did they start their sail from? BC, actually. And so they've been uh, living on a sailboat there and then went for a couple, I guess they were like in month three or so. And ironically, um, our friend Caitlin, uh, I hadn't talked to her since like college, probably like 10 or 12 years. And I saw her post a picture of a horse on a beach in Moorhead City. And I was like, I guide down there all the time and I'm yeah. like, where are you? And just like a random on social media. And um, so now we're in Warhead City. I said, yeah, I know, I know that beach. What are you doing? She's like, we're sailing around the world. She goes, come down and see us. I stayed with them for two days and in Warhead caught up and they're just going, they're going to Cancun uh, tomorrow. They said, come back down and join us. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. How long do they think that's going to take? Like, well, a year and a half, two years, something like that. I guess as long as it takes. Yeah, so I'm hoping to go visit them, like, in the South Pacific. Um, they're going to go to the Panama Canal and all over. So I, I'm super jealous, man. I'm like, gosh, I got I to gotta find a way to make money online so I can, like, guide when I want to and then yeah. get that type of stuff for, like, you know, six months, a year, or whatever. What, what's the sailboat like? Is it just giant? It's a 49-foot Moody. Um, and I guess Tommy is his name. He's had it for, I think, like, three years. And they were living on it in D.C., which is genius because then you're not paying rent. Right. Um, and, um, yeah, we were, like, doing some work on it because some things were breaking. And so I was helping him. And they had it anchored out off of a, off of a channel off Big Pine. And they were staying in a house of a friend of a friend on Big Pine. Um, and so it was super helpful. I had my flats boat. So I was, like, the shuttle around. And, like, <laughs> we gas tanks and water. And we need this part and this. So, that was a lot of the trip was kind of fooling around and getting them set up and making sure everything was good, which is fine by me. I didn't fish super hardcore like I usually would, but um, yeah, we had a lot of fun and uh, and st I still got to fish a lot. I fished most days, but it was cool. Were the tarpons showing up down there? They were just starting to get there. There's a bunch of guys fishing at night for them. Um, we were usually a little too deep in the beers by that for me to do anything <laughs> like that. Uh, I had a few shots one day with Tommy. He and I were exploring around, um, but I focused mainly on bonefish and permit, and uh, actually got my very first bonefish, which was very cool. Like, sweet. Um, I've been wanting to do that for years, and uh, caught it. Um, you know, on a bank that I've scoped out for like three years now, and I was like, I know there are bonefish and permit that come down this flat, and I staked out. I just floated it down the bank like I would on, you know, for chasing reds or something in North yeah. Carolina or whatever. And sitting there and he's casting a jig for Cuda off the back. And I was on the front just staying on the cooler. Saw this school, like 40 big, dark mullet. And I'm like, that's a weird looking school of mullet. <laughs> <laughs> Do the fly in front of them. And they started moving in two strips and bam. And I'm like, oh my God, it's a bone fish. It's a bone fish. It's a bone fish. That's Up awesome. Out of in hand, man. And, uh, it was really cool because I love that my favorite part of fishing like that I like to do personally is to like figure something out completely on my own or I take my boat or I take the kayak or I take whatever and I go okay I know I can figure this out and it might take a long time to do it but that's how I learned to redfish you know all down through the outer banks and, and crystal coast and stuff is just family vacations all right I got good wind today I'm just gonna go record that stuff and do it and now you know I can guide for it um but but just putting that getting that fish on my own fly my own boat own rod leader set up the whole nine yards and i'm no expert in the keys but 
That was really, really cool. And then, of course, I get the boat, let it go. And two minutes later, four more of them push down the bank and make another cast, catch another one. Nice. <laughs> well, a Keys bonefish is a lot, to me, a lot tougher than, you know, like a Belize bonefish. I know for a long time there was more redfish in Island Rada than there was bonefish. So, yeah, see they're coming back down there, too. Yeah, the numbers of them are, are supposedly pretty good. And I just caught a couple three-pounders, um, nothing special. But I did tell a lot of people, a lot of people told me that, that, like, yeah, the bonefish down there are not easy to catch. And I've never caught another one before. I've never been to the Bahamas. Belize is on the list. But just to just to do it like on my own, figure it out, like fish that spot that I found three or four years ago. Um, and I did have a couple shots at permit too, but they were being permit. Right. So <laughs> that's next to the list. That and the like big tarpon. And I uh, I thought about doing the tarpon thing at night, but we just we just were I mean whipped every day. You know, you're on the sun on the sun all day long on the boat, and then you start having white claws and seltzers <laughs> and whatever all that stuff and this is why i like to drink on my boat we're hanging out and, gotta hydrate uh, yeah i gotta go out to the bar a little bit and it's just like no we're gonna go back and watch some netflix or something like that and then get up early and do it again awesome so, yeah. um well for the people that don't know you i'm t- this morning we're talking to uh captain chris cease where are you you're in virginia now or north carolina I'm, I'm in Richmond, Virginia. I own a house here in Richmond, Virginia. I probably spent half time sleeping in my pickup truck or on my <laughs> boat, but uh, I do own property here, and this is kind of where I'm based out of guiding. Um, I've had a guide business here for, gosh, I think it's like nine years now. Um, I'm kind of shifting and spending more and more time down there fishing the Outer Banks and like the Moorhead City Cape Lookout area, guiding a lot more down there. Um, just, just kind of a little bit better saltwater game down that way yeah. um, which i really really love um but uh man in virginia here i was thinking about this morning like i could right now if i wanted to in virginia i could go fishing for brook trout musky smallmouth stripers bowfin snakehead largemouth carp like redfish sea trout all within about a two-hour drive of me yeah we've got everything up here um, which is fantastic. And being in Richmond is kind of the center of the state. Um, I can kind of do it all, uh, which, which keeps me on my toes. And it, it makes guiding a little more interesting, you know, in my opinion, because I can offer like five or six different trips for what people want to do. And it helps um, because people are so, um, so many people are beginners that I take out oftentimes. Right. So I say, tell me what you're doing. I don't get them on a flat, you know, like, looking for tail and reds with blowing 25 they're not used to it or can't do it it's you know tailor those trips to what what helps best for them that's smart too. build their confidence level on you know brim trips or striper trips or oh small mountain. oh yeah yeah uh my, my straight up beginner trip is basically wading a big creek and there are five pound bowfin in it and we've caught them and beginners have caught them but there's a lot of bass and smallmouth uh sunfish all sorts of stuff like that in there that are all a foot long and it's a blast when nobody's ever picked up a fly rod before and they just want to catch fish and have a good time and yeah explain things to them um in a way that you know they it gives them a level of of um they can make mistakes it's not that big of a deal it's not like they're throwing a, a size 16 dry fly to a roaring for a trout that's going to eyeball it on its side like before he takes it like you throw the popper out there and then if they're going on that trout trip later in the year, you know, they've got the idea of what they need to do. It gives them that, that uh, ability to get, get their foot in the door, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. No beginner wants to get cussed out in Spanish on a permit flat, you know, <laughs> No. <laughs> want to catch something, you know, so you're, no, you're, not, man. <laughs> you're still teaching a lot of people too, right? I do probably, uh, I don't know one or two minimum um casting lessons a week i mean during the season you know like like february all the way through september i'm probably doing two or three or four a week and that's where i just take folks to a park and teach them to actually cast um so um i really find that that getting them you know acclimated to the casting and how a rod works is a whole lot better to start out with that two hours of instruction than it is to get on the water and say, hey, go ahead and cast, because they're just sitting there thinking about the fish half the time anyways. Yeah. I might point out a fish to them, and they get all excited, and then everything, as you know, if you've been doing this for forever, it still goes to hell. Right. I mean, <laughs> you see a big fish, and they're they're really going to hell. Their knees are shaking or whatever. A cast, I mean, guy just the other day, Bofin's like 
10 feet off the boat. I'm like, okay, just cast to it. And he's like trying to like set the fly in front of yeah. it. So I'm going, no, 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 cast, cast, cast. He's like, what do you mean? I'm casting this. No, I want you to like. <laughs> Get it past him. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really good to teach somebody to cast. They can understand it um, better that way. Um, and then they can go out of the river and they'll, they'll have a lot more success. Um, you know, and I can say, do you want to look like Brad Pitt? does and a river runs through it like okay well that casting doesn't actually look like this so you know. right lose 45 pounds <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and you're also not going to be throwing tailing loops all the time i'm teaching not to do that over there. right so yeah so, so that's a that's a big a good thing that i do a lot in Ro- in roanoke the primary your primary guiding targets would be what the small mouth and the stripers so, well, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Richmond, yeah. But, yeah, sorry. Uh, That's what I'm no in. worries, man. No worries. I, I, I go down and fish down here in Roanoke. Stripers on the brain, I guess. No, it's fine. Yeah. Um, I drive about an hour and 15 minutes to Chesapeake Bay. And so, uh, fishing a lot there on the bay for stripers. Uh, we get a good redfish cycle throughout the sea, throughout every couple of years. And last year was pretty good. Um, oftentimes, we're catching those just kind of under dock. There are a few spots you can get them on flat. And just like that. But not like this. South Carolina, though, um, or even North Carolina. A lot of stripers. Last year, we had an incredible spec run. Um, I had a couple of days where we were catching several over 20 inches in the same position. Again, a lot of structure, rock piles, some grass flats that aren't clear water, but um, docks and stuff. Um, we got the James River running right through town, which unfortunately, the smallmouth fishery on that has gone down the tube. Um, that is a water quality issue, and there's a lot of blue catfish are eating the crap out of them. Um, you go up the river up from town and you get the fishing gets better and better and better. I don't really do float trips for that much uh, at all anymore. Um, I used to do those on the new down in Southwest Virginia with Mike Smith, who of course is a lineman. I ran a bunch of trips for him uh, the past couple springs. Um, that's a better smallmouth fishery, in my opinion, is in, in Southwest Virginia. Um, but James just, it, it needs to, it, we need to have some better um, recruitment here. Um, but my other species I target, um, a lot of warm water stuff, um, besides the stuff in the bay. But still, I'm now focused a lot on bowfin, um, largemouth bass. There's some rivers around here, and they're almost kind of like swamps, if you will, um, that just are fantastic fishery for bowfin, which I know you guys have those down there. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I love catching those things. <laughs> they're historic. They're mean. They got yeah. a mouth like a lacrosse ball with teeth. They're hard to hook. Um, but they're really aggressive. And then um, I don't know if you've heard of a snakehead. Mm-hmm. That species was introduced up in, in northern Virginia, Maryland, like 15 or 20 years ago, and they are slowly spreading south. And so um, we're able to drive about an hour, 15 minutes and, and go fish for some of those in some areas. So I, it, weren't they but, released by like the aquarium industry? Didn't somebody like release them? It's not the aquarium industry. It's people just dumping them yeah, out yeah. and had them in aquariums or whatever. And they, you know, the, all the media said, well, they're going to go ahead and eat and kill everything and they're going to destroy everything. And if you look back on it, you know, they're invasive. And well, if you look back on it, like largemouth bass are invasive too in a lot of these waters. So yeah. um, they do seem to take up, I think, a fair amount of biomass. Uh, I'm seeing less sunfish, but in terms of like wiping out the largemouth fishery, we're catching more and bigger largemouth than we were before. And I think it's kind of like a snakeheads might eat the baby largemouth, the largemouth are eating baby snakeheads. So I don't know. It's, it's been an interesting fishery to see it kind of grow up here. Um, and I don't do a ton of it. I'm hoping to focus more on it this summer. I got some friends that are really, really into it. Um, I have caught several of them and I've done a few trips for them and caught and got them. But, um, they're they're really aggressive. They can be tough, and you can catch both and bass while doing it. And oftentimes we're sight casting for them. We're doing big flies on eight weights, nine weights. Um, and man, the, the the snakeheads are really good to eat. So you don't mind killing them because they're invasive and they're not supposed to be there. And, right. and whatever. but uh, they do. They are spreading further and further south. It seems so. It's it's something that I don't think will ever go away. I know some states you had to kill them. If you caught one, you had to kill them. Yeah, Maryland had that. Maryland had like a bounty on them. You could get like a Bass Pro gift card for turning in dead ones here and there. And I think, I'm sure they would go out of business now at this point because there's so many of them around. But a 
lot of guys bow hunt them. Um, and they will just, you know, go into a creek that might be loaded with them and come out with 40 or 50 in a night, which is great if you're trying to eradicate them. But like as a guy that likes catching them here, uh, you know, I'm kind of like, man, I wish they didn't really do that, but they're not supposed to be here. So it's this, you know, two ends of the spectrum there. Um, yeah. to whether or not I really want them gone. I don't really want them gone, but I get that the guys are going to fill their freezer with them. I mean, okay, like you're, you're taking out something that shouldn't be there necessarily. Yeah. I watched a, a weigh in for a, a bow fishing tournament on Lake Murray one time and they were throwing all the fish in a dumpster. They were just weighing them and then throwing it in a dumpster. And my buddy runs the park. I was like, what, what's going on? He's like, see those two guys in the back. I was like, yeah. He's like, when this is over, they're going to bid on that dumpster. And they have cat food industry. And that's like your salmon blend or your ocean blend is really like <laughs> carp, gar, snakeheads, you know. It's not salmon and it's not an ocean blend. So that was what they were doing. They were bidding on that dumpster full of bow shot fish. So Wow. It, at least it didn't totally go to waste. I I'm not like not. the biggest fan of bow fishing. Like if cats. Guys want to shoot it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if guys want to shoot it, shoot them and eat them, like fine. But like I know guys that shoot them and toss them back in. I'm just kind of like, yeah, that's horrible. You know, eat it, do something with it. You know, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't like wasting. Wasting. Do the like uh, snakeheads where where you are? Do they get in that real pretty spawning colors? The the snakeheads get that like like modeled look almost the the bowfin will get some of those like tinted green like uh, uh fins here and there most of the ones i catch have like a brown to a reddish tint to them almost and some of them have a spot like a redfish and others don't i mean the spot looks just like a redfish spot the one that we were casting to the other day that wouldn't eat had a redfish spot on it i, I make a joke like tag them and go silly bowfin thinks it's a redfish <laughs> But uh, yeah, they they get in some cool colors, man, and and get lit up. And those snakeheads can be really like, it looks like that. You look at the side of it compared to like a python or something. Like they look kind of insane. Yeah. You know? So um, you have they're to fish a wild looking fish. You have to fish wire. Or are you just using heavy mono? I use like thirty or forty. Um, I don't like fishing wire. I rarely do anymore unless I'm really shark fishing. Um, even if I'm going after musky, I like to use like 80 pound fluoro. Um, but I mean, if I'm, I'm Spanish mackerel fishing, I mean, we were catching all these little cuda down in the keys, throwing 50 pound test on there. Um, I think it makes a difference. I don't think a lot of fish like, like wire so much. Um, and it, it seems like when you're making that cast, the fly doesn't always fully unroll like it should, you know, cause it's just not nearly as flexible. Um, or at least the, the, wire i've got is is stiffer stuff so i just like using like you know 30 or 40 you, you're fine they're not leader shy yeah. yeah so you recently did a flyman blog for us uh on kayak fishing for redfish and i think that's how yeah. we met uh kayak fishing down here at a undisclosed location yes uh, <laughs> i was a long give time that away. <laughs> no <laughs> i was hoping we were going to slip that name in there I there's no there's no fish there um <laughs> that was a long time ago what was that like 12 15 years before the flash shop and all that i lived in charleston for like eight months in 2007 or eight somewhere around there and yeah. i think you and i started talking somewhere on the one of those message boards the charleston fishing and i hadn't caught many redfish down there I just bought a kayak a tarpon 140 and you took me out there i don't think we caught anything but then i want to say we went like and i don't know if it was you or if another guy I went with we went and cast netted some mullet and threw them in a creek off of a uh, – it's a well-known area. I won't give it away because I know how the fishing is down in Charleston. But we were catching like 30, 35-inch reds and were towing us around. Um, out of that creek, just live line of those mullet on a falling tide. And I remember you saying specifically, you were like, these reds will eat needlefish that come out of it. I'm yeah. Like, is that needlefish? And you were like, yes, they do. But um, – I looked for that fly man that you gave me. It's somewhere around here. It's in a box. It's buried somewhere, you know, a million yeah. fly boxes. But I know I still have a pink and olive drum beater that you gave me that day. You're like, fish this. And then I see it like in the catalogs. And I'm like, damn, I got one of the original <laughs> ones of those, I think. It's so simple. It um, is. You, it is but, um, you still do a lot of kayak fishing? Uh, since I bought my flats boat three years ago, it's not nearly as much. Um, but when I think about it, I was thinking about it this morning going, man, 
I'm going to, I got a, I got a Creek in North Carolina that I absolutely hammer that like, if I take people to, they are blindfolded, no phones allowed type thing. And I, it, I only fish at high tide in my flats boat. And this summer, I think I'm going to tow my kayak up in there and fish at low tide too. Cause I think they'll pail in it. Yeah. But I have to get out of my, get out with my flats boat or I'll spend the whole night there. Um, but yeah, I, the kayaking thing, I, I really, really love, there's no better way to learn how these fish act and you've seen it a million times how they act on the flats and what they're doing just you know their body language and that type of thing and how they're going to eat a fly or how they're eating the crab on the bottom or shrimp or whatever um then being out there on the water when you're this high off of it you know and interacting in that environment and you don't get the same feeling i find when you're running around on a flats boat and you, you do slow down and pull and you're still quiet and whatnot. But there's a something about being like on that same level, I find that like mm-hmm. I see and hear things that I don't see or hear like when I'm running around in my flats. And you learn so much, even just paddling out to and from those spots. Um, and there's spots in North Carolina that I guide down near and I can sit up there in my kayak and it'll be in six inches of water and cast those schools of finning and tailing redfish. And there's a guy 100 yards away in the channel on his boat, and I can hear his client go, how come we're not over there with that guy catching those fish? <laughs> and, I'm, and he's like, I can't get in there. And I'm like, yeah, well, I got the guy back here, and I dumped it over there and paddled two miles. And um, it just opens up a whole new world, and it's, it's really, really cool. And I wanted to write that article because um, so many people uh, see me post all these redfish pictures because they're my favorite fish to catch, and they go, how can I do that myself? And, you know, I want them to say, well, pay me, you know, the guide fee a day, but then they want to still do it themselves. They, I understand they can't pay me every single day. So I go, look, you can get a stand up paddleboard or kayak these days for 500 bucks to use on Craigslist and go figure it out. And um, I won't tell anybody how to do it because you got to put in the time and effort. And I've put in years and years and years doing that. Um, but, you know, you go out there and you'll find them eventually. Just pick stay a high tide. Go, go start finding flats in Charleston. Pick yeah. high tides, yeah. you'll eventually find them. Yeah, stay yeah. shallow. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That, that's it. And it just depends on on the water. You just got to start exploring. And with the technology today, it's in it's insane. I mean, um, go on Google Earth and start looking at grass flats. I mean, I tell this to people all the time that, that are fishing down in the Outer Banks. You know, I say... Pick behind Nag's head and go on Google Earth and start looking at grassy areas and paddle them and start fishing. And you'll find them eventually. If you're out there and out there enough, you'll find them. Um, and it's the same way down there in Charleston, I imagine. I haven't fished Charleston in years, but um, hope, hope to change that soon. But it's, it's the same thing, man, you know. Yeah, that's what I would tell people. Go to, go to a place and then come back and look at it on Google Earth, and then you're going to see what you were what you were fishing and what the grass levels are, and then just try to duplicate it. Try to find something similar and go from there. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And there's, in, in terms of the kayak fishing, like hooking up to them in the kayak and getting towed around is so fun and like all that type of stuff. And you know, try not to fall out, <laughs> things of that nature. <laughs> I, I would get frustrated, especially with the tail and reds and the high tides, because you would get the perfect, perfect position, put your paddle down, pick up your rod, and then the son of a bitch changes course and turns around, mm-hmm. and you're like, I got to put my pat rod down. So I just yeah. like to get out at that point, you know. It's it's that way, man. And and the the thing I fish so much more in North Carolina now than than uh, the Low Country. Um, the Low Country has so many more tailing fish. But you got to watch where you step out, as you well know, because you go up to your waist in bluff mud. In North Carolina, I can step out on a grass flat and it's just got sand underneath and I'm not going to sink. And so it allows you to do that. And also the water clarity in North Carolina seems to be a lot clearer, at least up there around like Cape Lookout or the Outer Banks or whatever. Um, The water clarity, I mean, some days it looks like you're fishing in the Bahamas. And I remember being fishing down there in, in the low country and being like, man, this water is like coffee. Yeah. And you're looking for like a swirl or a push or something. When I'm fishing, you know, behind Oregon Inlet or something like that, like I am seeing that fish cruise and swim down a bank and I can lead him and sight cast him and watch him make that eat. 
And also, like you said, if they change direction, I've got like an easier way of looking at him. If he spins all the way around, because I can actually see the fish in the water. Versus yes. Pale drop. You don't know where he's re-popping up, uh, you know, in a couple of minutes. Or whatnot. So it's just a different, different type of fishing for the same fish. Um, but I really love watching them eat it when I'm like leading them by a couple of feet and, you know, see their fins pop out and then accelerate and eat it. That's just so freaking cool. Yeah, they are about the perfect game fish in my opinion. They are. I'm with they you. Are. Yeah, oh. and 60% of the time they'll eat anything and the other 40% of the time they're hard and you got to figure out what they're eating or switch flies up and things of that nature. So yeah. when you go down to the North Carolina coast, you're doing redfish charters and sea trout? And yeah, I do a bunch of redfish charters. I do a lot of uh, uh, the false alcor in the fall as well. That's what I was going to um, ask. Yep, I do that. Uh, we'll go after sharks. Um, I have a penchant for finding big flounder on fly, actually. Nice. Um you can take a uh, a cloud like a half and half that's gray over white with a chartreuse tail, and they can't refuse it if you know where they're at. And you bounce it on like a, a intermediate line. I mean, catching flounder on fly is really fun. Uh, Spanish mackerel, bluefish. I really just love focusing on the reds, um, shallow water ones. I also, do the uh, the the ones in the noose that Gary Dubiel does the big ones. They can. Kind of all over that's why i love it down there so much that moorhead city area is like it's a world-class fishery you can fish for anything you want depending on the wind or tide unless it's really really you know hurricane blowing and you just got an endless amount of species um i've seen tarpon rolling out there off the beach yeah and throwing yeah. flies out of didn't didn't get them to eat but um you know there's there's a lot of fish out there it seems to be one of those areas too that hasn't been like just hammered with you know high rises and there's just not not doesn't seem to be that many people i mean there's it's, all good people there but it's not like you know coming down here you see myrtle beach and shit like that it's not nothing like that you know oh yeah i mean people ask me where to fish myrtle beach i, go, I have no idea because all i know is high rise and there's, there's a lot of there bars yeah i don't want to be there and there's atlantic beach there and it's it's a it is a tourist destination for the summer and stuff but you're right like if you go north up, or what they call down east, um, which is heading northeast uh, up towards like the Cedar Island area, I mean, it is backwoods North Carolina, and there is nothing back there. There's a bunch of locals back there, and all they do are fishermen and local watermen, and it is like way out. You feel like you are in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and you know, there's got a lot of areas protected, protected seashore, so you don't have all those high rises and stuff. And you can be fishing underneath the lighthouse uh, there at Cape Lookout, and then run like 20 minutes down to down uh, to uh, Atlantic Beach, and then you're fishing like all the houses on the beach. So it's got like kind of that best of both worlds. But you're right, it's not overdeveloped where it feels like it's, it's like Myrtle or anything. Yeah. Myrtle Beach is kind of an anomaly. It's just the worst thing that came to mind. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 uh, and I love the state of West Virginia. It's West Virginia in, in, uh, on the beach right there. Totally. It's the brunt of all the bad jokes for some reason. Yeah. It, it is a brunt of all bad jokes of just the, the, yeah, all that stuff. And I, I love West Virginia. I fish in West Virginia. I do too. So not knocking that state. I love that state. <laughs> um, so what are your favorite patterns to throw redfish around the coast there? I, lo I love that pheasant bugger changer, Utah. That thing was bitching. Dude, I just, uh, I came up with that last year. Um, I fish a lot of a, you, I'm sure you know what a Murdich wiggler is. Yeah. I tie a version of a redfish, a, a, a redfish wiggler. I just tie a version of that. I fish that a lot. Um, but lately I've been going to a lot more um, natural colors. I'm finding that like, some of these spots I'm fishing, there are other guides fishing them, and oftentimes they are spin fishermen, and they're throwing gold spin, like the whole day. And I got to the point that one of my favorite flats, um, the one that the guys, you know, you hear the clients like yelling at me, say yelling their guide to say to get over where I'm at, those fish were starting to refuse gold and copper wigglers. And that fly like just hammers fish. And I'm like, man, like this is crazy. They're seeing so many gold spoons, they've either been caught and released, or they see their buddy get ripped out or whatever, you know, they're getting used to it. Um, I'm going to start going to natural. And so I'll take just a, anything that looks shrimpy or crabby, um, tans, browns, sometimes throw a little chartreuse in there. And it is rare that you'll get a fish refuse something that looks more natural. 
And so I had a couple of people that sent me some pheasant skins that they had shot those birds and just said, hey, I got a bunch of feathers and pheasants. And that's like a really common tying material too that you can buy. I mean, you can buy them in a store for 15 bucks. Like, look at all these feathers that are just sitting here. I'm like, what can I do with this thing? And I would go, if you are wrapping this like palmering hackle, it looks really cool when you get yellow and brown and blue all barred in there. And I go, I'm just going to make this thing look like a woolly bugger for redfish. And I started throwing that in front of fish and it looks like a woolly bugger for redfish. And it just, you know, you put a couple legs and eyes if you want. And man, they just hammer it. I mean, if you get it in front of them and they see it, they will eat it. It can imitate a fiddler crab. Um, I've thrown it for smallmouth, caught them on that. Um, so that's just more natural stuff. Um, I got a fiddler crab fly. I got to send to you. I just tied a buffalo hair. And that one works really, really well. It's, uh, it's tan and brown and it just imitates, you know, very basic imitation of a fiddler. And that fly has been working well for me for years. Um, lately, I've been getting into throwing them some topwater stuff. So this is a fly right here I developed it's called okay. a bank walker, which looks like a mullet. It's kind of like a musky fly downsized um i just had this sitting here and tied this one up last night i caught a big redfish on this on top uh last last spring in florida and i've been throwing those um it rattles and does all sorts of crazy swimming stuff on the water and you know a couple inches deep and it, it it's a lot of fun to throw so um and just the other day i i went back to throw on a freaking uh sea deucer it's like they're not eating anything, whatever. I was down in Florida, messing around, trying to find these fish. They're not eating anything. I'm like, I need something that's going to land super light. The fish are really spooky. And just twitch and hang in front of them. And I put on a sea deuce or bam. Yep. Like, you know, what, the old classics that? are fun to go back to on occasion. Yeah, I like to tie a grizzly, all grizzly seducers. That thing is a killer. Just weedless, bead chain eyes to maybe get it a little deep. And man, they hang yeah. it. You're right. Yeah, I've got a fly that acts a lot like it called an Egyptian mule driver which is I put those little bee chain eyes on the front to just get it down enough. And it's got rabbit on it, legs and some uh, camel some EP wrap. And man, that thing, I've caught so many fish on that fly. And that's another one that I throw a lot of. Yeah. It just looks shrimpy and minnowy. And again, they're all really suggestive. They're not like a particular thing. And if you get it in their face, I mean, most of the time they'll eat it. I found that with the redfish here, there used to be this fly came out a long time ago called the Perminator. It was a little crab and it was looked like it was made of uh, like faux leather or something. It was perfectly painted, had perfect little crab claws. And I had ne I'd never caught a redfish on it. In fact, it scared them. And, you know, I, I don't move flies for tail and reds. I just throw it, let them come eat it, let it do its yeah. thing. And uh, they would come to that thing and literally as fast as they could run away from it, they would run away from it. And the only <laughs> thing I could think of was my whole hypothesis was that crabs don't like take on redfish. They're not like, come on. I'm, I'm yeah. Yeah. I'm they're like, like, come on, you know, get me out of here. Yeah. And red's like, oh, <laughs> something, something's a miss, you know, but, 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 but it's funny. Cause then they'll eat a, they'll eat a, a gym sock. Yeah. Or what's, what's the popular fight about a copperhead crab? Like, that's just like a gold penny. Like you throw it on their face and look anything like it. They see the flash and they go for it. Yeah, it's weird. They'll run away from something else, and then one day they'll only eat that. It's that's the anomaly that makes them really fun, I think. And they're found, you know, they're found in a lot of the country. You know, to what Texas to Virginia? Texas to Virginia. Uh, a guy told me at one of the shows last year that one was caught off of New Jersey. Um, I think that fish is either lost or global warming is really, really heating up fast. Um, but you can technically catch them in Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay in the Maryland waters, but generally Virginia, yeah. And I would be surprised if, if they're all the way around that Texas coast, you could probably catch them in Mexico too, as it as it goes down the, the, yeah. the bank there. Down Brownsville. Yeah, yeah, whatever. I mean, that whole area. I've never fished down there. I haven't either. It's it's on the list, just like everywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> What's crazy about that place is there's zero tide. You know, you can go down there and just the tide never moves. Or if it does, it's like a foot every 12 hours. And yeah, to me, that's baffling. And then our tide moving six out, six feet every six hours is kind of blows their mind. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. what, and and that's like Louisiana, actually. You get like a foot yeah. or two move out of a 12 hour tide. And it's, it's not like that. Yeah. You guys have the six, seven footers. Uh, in North Carolina, we probably have, you know, 
Outer Banks, Moorhead area, Crystal Coast, you're getting like three to four to maybe a five. It's like huge, but in that like three to four range. Um, on the Chesapeake Bay, it's about foot and a half, two feet. It's not huge at all. Um, so yeah, it, it all depends on where you're at, like how you got to figure out how to do that. Um, the beauty of it, I listened to you talking to uh, John Mauser, of course, he fishes just a little further south of where I'm usually at, but I fished down his way too. I, I talked to him a lot. Great guy. Um, but, uh, you know, you, I think you mentioned like, yeah, you got to get off the flat, like, or else you're going to get stuck out there. <laughs> and whereas I'm fishing like in the outer banks, like Oregon Inlet, like you don't really have to, because it doesn't move that much or there are, well, there's waterways I'm fishing that like, there are better at low tide because that's a deep grass flat and you can't find them on it when there's six feet of water on top of it. When there's two, okay, then you can shuffle over that spot and fish that area as well. So yeah, they're, they're all the spots are totally different. Yeah, I remember the first couple of times I got stuck in the high tide flats. My wife or girlfriend at the time was like, if you just wanted to stay out, you can tell me. I just sent her a picture and she's like, oh my God, looks like you got dropped on the moon. I was like, I'm telling you, I'm stuck. Like that water goes out quick. You just got to go with it or you're stuck. Well, well, if you fish that area that we fished out in that open spot, I've stayed out there before. Mm. And it's literally like, like you said, like the moon. I mean, it's just mounds of oyster bars. Yeah. And you're sitting in three inches of water in like a trickle, wait two hours, like nap, get sunburned, <laughs> wait till they come back in and start looking that edge again for, for those fish. Yeah, yeah. that's wild. Yeah. <laughs> that's a fun place. You got to come back. We'll go back out there. I'm actually planning on coming down hopefully in about a month. So I'll oh, definitely cool. give you a shout and I'll bring, I'll probably bring the huge red fisher and, and a kayak too. So we got, a, down we got a little a flats boat here at the shop we could take too. So if you don't even want to, okay. bring it, we can just take that. Or we can take the panga out and look for big, big stuff. Cobia should cool. be here. I'm, I'm down for all of it, man. I'm down yeah. for all of it. Where are you staying? Uh, I'll just couch surf. That's nice. what I usually do. I, I, I got a bunch of friends that are still down there and, a lot of friends post college moved down that way and started families and stay down there and stuff. So I'll go down to couch surf. I just haven't made it back down there probably like I think about three years or so. I just invariably end up fishing North Carolina more and more and more because I've gotten there and I okay, well, this is where you end up learning more about it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll, I sleep in my truck half the time. I couch surf a lot. It's rare that I pay for a place to sleep. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty. I like to do it. <laughs> yeah, totally um well that's awesome yeah the, the redfish should be about perfect then so they're already tailing now so it should be red hot by the time okay okay cool cool bugs will be biting bad i'm sure oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's no seams or no joke man oh they're terrible i've been they're going terrible, to my kids man. baseball games and they're eating me alive like really? I'm everything i'm putting a dryer sheet in my hat and like no gnats and everything citronella they're just brutal so uh, I, the guy that I, that I stay with on, on the Outer Banks, is, is he's been down there for 20 years, and the mosquitoes and greenheads do not bite him anymore. And he's like, I, he's like, I think they just bit me so much, like the taste of my blood or whatever. You think you haven't lived in Charleston for so long, they wouldn't want to taste you any longer. But I love it. I <laughs> love it. Are you, <laughs> like yeah, I, the thermocells don't work for those, so... Wow. That's rough. The, you got to get to that D100 then. Oh, I, I got it. The Alaskan Old Spice. I've tried that too. Um, <laughs> they just, they'll still come close enough to you to annoy you. I don't think they're actually landing on you, but it's pretty, pretty annoying. But I think yeah. they'll, that's more of a spring thing. I think they'll kind of wash out of here by summer. Okay. It'll be hot. Okay. Cool. Um, cool. Well, sweet. You uh, fishing today? Time flies. I've been tying flies. I just got another order for some guys down in Florida that said they want me to tie them some snook flies. Um, I just finished up an order last night, which I got a couple more to do. Um, I'll probably be uh, I'll probably be working on the boat. It's sitting out back there. Um, I got a little fuel issue I'm trying to, uh, to deduce, and I've got to figure that thing out. It's like stalling out at really low idle speed. So my mechanic buddy says it's you know, this one part and you got to dig in there and try and fix it or clean it out of it. So that inner yeah, fuel filter. It's, it's like, it's called a VST. I got a yeah. F-115 and you got to take the manifold off. I was watching YouTube videos yesterday about it. Get in there and clean out this tiny little filter, you know, and I've changed every other filter in there and you know how it goes, man. It's, there's a boat. It's always needs working on. Either yeah. that or the trailer. Always, always, always. So I'll probably do that this afternoon. Tie some flies and, um, I got a couple of clients that are 
asked about going down there to fish at Weldon here later this week, or early next week. So I'm trying to schedule all that out there. So just just doing the odds and ends today. Nice. Uh, well, sweet. Yeah. We appreciate you uh, talking to us. We'll put a link up to your website. So if anybody wants okay. to, to get in touch with you, talk to you about fishing or buy any of your flies, they can do that there. And yes, uh, sure, definitely, definitely hit me up when you come down and we'll make, we'll uh, make a solid plan. Okay. Yeah. That'd be great. I'd love to see you again. And uh, hopefully we'll get into them this time. Heck yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good, good catch up, Scotty. I'll yeah, talk man. to you later. Thanks, bud. Good to see you. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.